friends and colleagues, um, welcome to the Tom Sperling Oration. Uh, I'm Beth Webster, Director of the Centre for Transformative Innovation here at Stimmen University. It's my pleasure to host you this evening. Um, I'm very pleased to see the um, absolute cream of the IP glitterati uh, from Melbourne here tonight. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and also pay our respects to all Aboriginal community elders, past and present, who have resided in the area. Uh, before we start tonight's proceedings, may I ask that you place your mobile devices on silent mode. Um, those of you who wish to share this evening's presentation, please use the event hashtag hash Tom Sperling Oration um, and the CTI Twitter handle at CTI Swinburne. Um, now I'd like to invite the Chancellor of Swinburne, Mr Graham Goldsmith, to address the audience. Thank you very much, Beth. And uh, I would also like to welcome warmly everybody here this evening for the Centre for Transformative Innovation's inaugural Tom Sperling Oration. And at the outset, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay respects to all Aboriginal community elders, past and present. It is indeed most appropriate that this oration is named in honour of Swinburne's Professor of Innovation Studies, Tom Sperling AM, whose contribution to the advancement of science <coughs> spans over 55 years. Notably acknowledged for his role in the development and commercialisation of plastic banknotes, Professor Sperling is widely regarded as an expert in the commercialisation of research. His extensive experience in managing the process of translating research into commercial products includes breakthroughs such as the 30-day contact lens and the MyX water purification process. Professor Sperling now works at the Centre for Transformative Innovation here at Swinburne and has written extensively on science, technology and innovation policy and practice. He was awarded a CSIRO postgraduate studentship in 1963 and a CSIRO overseas studentship in 1965 attending the University of Maryland. He was a lecturer in chemistry at the University of Tasmania from 1967 until 1969, and indeed just introduced me to his second honours student. And he was then appointed a research scientist at the CSIRO. For many years, he worked in, in, uh, as a role as a research scientist and then in a variety of senior roles at CSIRO from 1969 to 2002 including a year as Senior Private Secretary to Senator the Honourable Gareth Evans, AC, former Foreign Minister and now Chancellor of the ANU in Canberra. Tom served on the CSIRO board from 2008 to 2015, was President of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute in 1987, President of FASTS, the predecessor of Science and Technology Australia, and was a member of the Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council. He won the RACI Rennie Memorial Medal in 1971 and the Leighton Memorial Medal in 1994 and managed the World Bank funded CSIRO Lippi Management System Strengthening Project in Indonesia from 98 to 2001. We're fortunate that he's been with us at Swinburne since 2002 and he was the Chief Executive of the CRC for Wood Innovations from 2005 to 2008. Recently, Tom was awarded the prestigious 2017 Australia and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science Medal. The ANDIS Medal is awarded annually for services for the advancement of science or administration and organisation of scientific activities or the teaching of science throughout Australia and New Zealand and in contributions to science which lie beyond normal professional activities. And based on this shortened bio, I'm sure you can see the reasons that he's received that award. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to ask Professor Tom Sperling to address us.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chancellor, for that uh, introduction uh, to the, this uh, lecture. And it's a great uh, and unexpected honour, really, for me to have a, a, an oration named after me, and I thank the University for this. So listening to that, you can see that my daughter, Elizabeth, who is here in the audience tonight, is right. I have lived a charmed life. And I often attribute this to the love and support of my charming wife, uh, Heather, and my family, most of whom are here tonight. But I thought briefly I'd like to tell you a bit about four other people who have um, contributed to the uh, whatever I have uh, achieved in my 55 years as a, uh, as a scientist. Dr. Jerry Bottomley was my honours and PhD supervisor at the University of Western Australia. And the, one of the things that he taught me was to write. I, he took whatever I wrote and corrected it and taught me to write. He also taught me just as importantly the importance of not only to be able to perform high class experimental work, do high class experimental work, but also the importance of having an understanding and developing the theoretical framework behind those uh, experiments. And that uh, has kept me, uh, that, that lesson has uh, stayed with me my whole career. The University of Western Australia in, in the 1960s had plenty of money. We were doing um, very high precision measurements of the pressure, volume, temperature relations of gases. And there's a, a, a great, um, uh, theoretical interest in this but also practical interest in it and uh, some of our measurements had commercial interest. We, For example we were hired by RCI in England to measure the properties of their new anaesthetic halothane and we just gave the results to the company because we didn't have to worry about money or intellectual property. We were just doing our research funded by the university. So I went to the University of Maryland, as uh, Graham has mentioned, and my postdoctoral supervisor was Dr. Ed Mason, and he was very happy to have me there because of my peculiar combination of theory and experiment. And uh, he got me to be the co-author of, of a book, The Virial Equation of State, which summarised all aspects of that field and uh, this book is still being cited. It has, I looked up just before I came, it was already been cited eight times in uh, 2017. So it's quite an interesting uh, 1969 book to be uh, still cited. My work at Maryland was funded by NASA and the US Atomic Energy Commission. NASA was interested in this field because of its relevance to rocket fuels and the Atomic Energy Commission was very interested because of its importance to thermal diffusion processes that are used in the enrichment of uranium. So we, once again, we weren't worried about intellectual property. We did the work, sent the, all of our reports to NASA and, and the Atomic Energy Commission and published our papers so we didn't um, we didn't have uh, <coughs> any interest at that time in intellectual property as we know it today. When I was leaving Maryland in 1967, I remember Ed Mason told me, he said, when I first met you, I couldn't believe that anybody who had your accent could be any good at all. <laughs> but he gave me some good advice. He said, Start your research as soon as you get to your new job and never stop doing it. And I've, I've taken that advice um, uh, ever since. So we go now to, the to 1980 and Dr. David Solomon, who is in the audience tonight, must have thought I had some potential because he tapped me on the shoulder and made me the Assistant Chief of the Division of Applied Organic Chemistry. And for the next 40 years, Dave and I have talked, discussed, argued, tried to work things out about how do we turn public investment in science into economic and social benefit. And uh, Dave has been a great guide for me in this and uh, while we seldom agree, we have a lot of good arguments and discussions. And so we're both um, uh, 
understand that we'll be always finding different ways of doing this and we hope that uh, this ongoing lecture th series will make an important contribution to this debate. So in 2003 now, soon after I came to Swinburne, CSIRO was developing a proposal for a CRC for finding biologically active compounds in native plants in Indonesia. And Greg Simpson, who apologises for not being here tonight, said that they needed a statement for this proposal on how they were going to address the social issues around traditional uses and traditional ownership of uh, plants in Indonesia and said, you must have someone at Swinburne who can do this. So I rang up both my, two of my children, Elizabeth and Paul, who are both here, and said, is, who, who, is there someone at Swinburne who, who I could get to do this? And they said, Michael Gilding is the only sensible sociologist at Swinburne, get him. <laughs> so I went over to Michael's office and told him the, the story. I, I was at, down the road at, uh, at the corner of Henry Street, so it took me about 10 minutes to walk there. I, I told Michael what I wanted. I walked back to my office, and when I got there on my email was a uh, brilliantly written little piece addressing the issues that I talked about and so I sent it off. We didn't get the CRC because the other bits weren't written as nearly as well as Michael's <laughs> bit. So when I finished my term as the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Industrial Sciences, the Vice Chancellor said I could work in any group that I liked in the university, just you pick someone. So I remember this bit about Michael. I went to his office and offered my services to him. Much to my astonishment, he didn't jump at the chance. He said, I'll need your CV. <laughs> so I, sent, I went back with the, my tail between my legs, got my CV, sent it to him, and he wrote me back and said, oh, yeah, oh, you can come and work here. So fortunately for me, he did that, and we've had more than a decade of, similarly with Dave, of talking and uh, working on various aspects of the social, economic and legal processes that are important to all successful innovation. So thank you very much uh, both Dave and Michael for the contributions that you've made to my career. So once again, I would very much like to thank the university for establishing this, um, uh, this, these lectures, which are going to cover all aspects of the innovation process. I'm very pleased indeed that the in inaugural lecturer is uh, Professor Rochelle Dreyfus, a chemist by initial training and a lawyer, and a world leading intellectual property scholar. So this is a great honour for me, and I look forward to many years of participating in the occasion. Thank you. So as Tom has mentioned, it's a great privilege for Swinburne to be able to host uh, Professor Rochelle Dreyfus um, at Swinburne this year for her sabbatical. Professor Dreyfus is the Pauline Newman Professor of Law at New York University um, School of Law and the co-director of the Engelberg Centre on Innovation Law and Policy. She holds degrees in chemistry, as we've just heard, and spent several years as a research chemist before entering Columbia, Columbia University School of Law. Professor Dreyfus has an impeccable intellectual property legacy, which includes her time as an expert on the UN, for the UN on cultural rights regarding patent policy, as a consultant to the US Federal Court Study Committee, the US Presidential Committee on Commission on Catastrophic Nuclear Accidents, and at the US Federal Trade Commission. She served on multiple National Academy of Science committees, such as the Intellectual Property in Genomic and Protein Research, intellectual property rights in the knowledge-based economy and on science, technology and law. She was a member of the Health and Human Services Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health and Society and is a past chair on the Intellectual Property Committee of the American Association of Law Schools. In addition to her many articles in her specialty areas, she's also co-authored books on intellectual property law and especially international intellectual property law. Over and above this, Professor Dreyfus has become well known for her ability to cut to the crux of an issue. She's quick to understand how intellectual property can be used to enhance social well-being. 
but also she can point out very clearly where it can frustrate the innovation system. She's a clear thinker in an esoteric and technically complex world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome Professor Rochelle Dreyfus. So thanks, Beth, for that nice introduction and also inviting me uh, to spend part of my sabbatical at Swinburne and for giving me the honor of delivering the inaugural Tom Sperling oration. It's been wonderful to get to know the university, Melbourne and Hawthorne, and to spend time with friends, all my friends down under. I'm thrilled that several of them are here tonight. Um, it's also been terrific to meet Tom himself. I've given named lectures before but the person who is named is usually not, um, shall we say, in a position to converse. Um, so this oration is really special because Tom is alive and kicking, as you can see, and he's spent um, the last few months telling me absolutely fabulous stories about Australian politics. Um, so Beth suggested uh, that for the lecture, I think big and offer my vision of the intellectual property regime of the future, that I write on a clean slate and describe the law that would best convert the creativity of future authors, scientists, and technologists into products and processes that improve social welfare. Now that's a fitting topic for a lecture honoring Tom, who as you heard has spent his career promoting science and thinking about ways to efficiently transform innovative ideas into real world applications. And in some ways I'm qualified to make good on the request. Uh, like Tom, and as you heard, I started my career as a chemist uh, in the firm that's now Novartis, uh, and saw firsthand the difficulty of moving ideas off the lab bench and into the marketplace. In my case, taking medical research and turning it into pharmaceuticals that consumers can take safely and effectively. I found that job totally frustrating, and it's why I decamped to law school. I now teach intellectual property law, IP law, patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrecy law. And my fascination with the topic stems from its role in the transformation process that's been so central for Tom. Sadly, however, I'm not quite up to Beth's challenge. I can't see enough of the technological future to opine on how the legal landscape should be constructed. Politics also plays a large role in shaping the law. And as we all now certainly know, it's really hard to predict what will happen in that arena. What I can do is consider the trouble spots that are emerging, how they might be handled, and what we need to know more about in order to be prepared for whatever future eventuates. This oration is in short, more research agenda and less new world order. Mostly it's about substantive law but institutions are also crucial, so I've included a few words on them as well. So substance. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Will we actually need intellectual property in the future? IP rights create scarcity. They authorize an inventor, an author, a trader to exclude everyone else from using what he or she created. Without competition, the right holder can then charge higher prices. Of course, that system produces deadweight loss. There are people who would benefit from the innovation, but they can't afford the higher price, so they don't buy it, and the right holder doesn't sell it, so look what happens, everyone loses. However, the extra profit, the transfer of consumer surplus into producer surplus, enables the inventor to capture a return roughly commensurate with the value created. In that way, IP rights create, produce incentives, financial encouragement to invest in costly and risky creative activities and to develop manufacturing techniques and distribution channels, and to educate consumers about why they want the product and how to use it, and to signal quality and maintain that quality. In the short term, there are higher prices and deadweight loss, but in the long term, the incentives spur innovation. We sacrifice static efficiency in order to enjoy dynamic efficiency. There are, however, problems with this basic story, and they're getting worse as new technologies come on board, and we move into the information age and the knowledge economy. <coughs> the most glaring problem of the story is that it ain't necessarily so. The assumption that monetary incentives are necessary to spur innovation is deeply rooted, but is it right? Is it always right? Will it forever be right? 
given the new technologies that are being produced. So in many spheres, people actually produce without IP incentives. They do it because creating is fun. Think about that homemade stuff, user-generated content that we see on the internet. One example, YouTube video of a baby dancing away to Prince's Let's Go Crazy. Or they create because they want, there's something they want to do and they need to invent things to do it with. So windsurfing equipment, laboratory research tools, surgical equipment, all invented that way. It's hard to quantify this user innovation, because, but Eric Von Hippel of MIT has shown it accounts for a significant share of the knowledge economy. Sometimes inventors are driven by curiosity. Think university scientists funded by government or other organizations or DIY biologists experimenting in their basements. And not, if not for those sort of intrinsic awards, then sometimes there are ways to cash out that have nothing to do with IP. There's university profs. They know that publication earns them a reputation. The reputation gets them better students, more lab space, higher salaries, maybe a medal from the Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science, a <laughs> minister's prize, maybe a Nobel. So even now, we sometimes pay monopoly prices for things that might have been invented anyway. Technical journals are the poster child here. Articles created and edited by scientists, and then Elsevier or some other publisher uses its copyrights to extort fortunes from libraries. And that's now, when it's mainly computers and the internet that lower the costs associated with innovation. In the future, the fundamental IP story may become even less right. Consider 3D printing, synthetic biology, artificial <coughs> intelligence, AI, robotics. These technologies will bring costs down nearly to zero. We already enjoy computer-generated music, movies and TV shows that use computer-created effects and backgrounds, virtual actors, the resurrected Princess Leia, for example. So AI will do the developing, printers, robots, etc. will manufacture, and it will all happen in our homes, so there'll be no distribution costs. We will, in short, be entering what commentators have dubbed the post-scarcity society. That presents a general problem for the public order. Will there be enough jobs to go around? For IP, we must ask, what point is a trademark, which is intended to denote the source and quality of goods, if goods are typically made at home? Are patents and copyrights necessary if there's no significant investment and less risk? We could give creators regular salaries, put innovative products in the public domain, price them competitively, and let everyone who can benefit enjoy access. Worryingly, right holders are now pushing in exactly the opposite direction, trying to limit the use of these amazing technologies in the name of maintaining profits. For example, those holding rights in music and videos have been asserting theories of secondary liability against intermediaries, websites or internet service providers that enable uploading, downloading, and streaming. It's easy to understand why. Suing the intermediary is much more efficient than suing all the end users. But it takes the fun away, makes sharing harder, creates distribution costs that don't have to exist. And because intermediaries are risk averse, they take things down even when, under the law, the use is considered fair and not compensable. So one example, that dancing baby. The video was taken down, but later held to constitute a fair use of Prince's song. The intermediaries may also benefit themselves uh, from this regime because the, the prospect of secondary liability may chill others from developing superseding technology. So one emerging issue is that new technologies could make IP rights irrelevant. Another way in which new technologies change the core story is that they enable creators to earn a return that's much larger than the value of their contributions. And that's true even when we take into account the hefty profits needed to compensate them for taking risks. That can happen in several ways. I'll mention a few. One has to do with what's getting invented. At one time, upstream discoveries, basic fundamental science, and downstream commercial applications were distinct, often with a longish temporal gap between the two. It was usually clear what was the scientific principle, say Boyle's law, which could stay in the public domain, and what was the application, a steam engine, uh, which could be the subject of an IP right. 
Now, for many technologies, that gap has disappeared. While IP rights on these dual-use technologies may motivate research, rights over basic science give inventors control over not only what they discovered, but over follow-on prospects as well. Gene patents are an example. Myriad owned patents on genes associated with breast cancer, both in Australia and the United States, and started enforcing them. These patents created more profit for Myriad. It could hold out for high royalties, but it also meant there were fewer researchers who could work on breast cancer. To quote Justice Breyer of the US Supreme Court, such patents impede rather than promote the progress of science and the useful arts. They give the first right holder a lock on future innovation. To understand a second reason rewards expand, consider Facebook. If you're using it, what are the chances you'll switch to another social network site? Probably near zero. Facebook started off with IP, rights arguably justified by Mark Zuckerberg's inventive contribution. I'll put aside the Binklevoss twins. Uh, but it's not the IP that made it so powerful. That comes from formidable network effects. The value to you increases as more people in your circle are also on Facebook. You won't abandon it unless your family, your millions of friends abandon it as well. Once network effects set in, no one can compete even after the IP expires. And Facebook is not the only high-tech firm enjoying this form of entrenchment. A third technique for expanding rewards, rent rather than sell. Or as my colleague Jason Schultz put it in his recent book, end ownership. So consider books. Back in the day I bought a book, I could keep it for life. And because of copyright's first sale doctrine, the copyright holder had no say over whether I sold it, loaned it to friends, or rented it to strangers. With e-books, it's all very different. There's no sale. They are licensed and alienated on a technological tether. That lets the publisher control my use. It can even make the book disappear. It's great for publishers, they can sell more books. And since there's no longer a secondary market of used books, they can also raise prices. Of course, it's understandable that digital publishers want to maintain control. If it's easy to make copies, then no one will buy. But the idea has gotten out of hand. We could see electric cars that limit how far we can drive without buying additional permission, equipment that can only be fixed by dealerships that the right holder owns and charges for separately. Things can be made to stop working until we buy them again. If you have an iPhone, you already have a glimmer of how that works. So what should we do about these problems? One possibility is to invalidate the IP rights. That was the US Supreme Court solution in AMP against Myriad and the Australian High Courts in Darcy against Myriad. They held that the genes are not patentable. We could also reject patents on other new technologies that threaten follow-on innovation. In the US, that's led to a denial of patents on diagnostic, computational and networking methodologies, algorithms, AI inventions, machine learning protocols. On the copyright side, we have the Supreme Court's refusal to protect databases. But is that the best solution? Will there be adequate incentives if we simply ban protection in emerging areas? A strong argument can be made that despite my doubts about the relationship between innovation and IP protection, we do still, at least sometimes, need IP to support creative production. Besides, if innovators are deprived of patents or copyrights, they might respond in ways we like even less. For example, Myriad, in anticipation of losing its patents, started keeping information about genetic mutations as trade secrets. Algorithms are also mostly protected that way, and data as well. To be sure, patents and copyrights privatize information, but they also disclose. Eventually, the rights expire. In contrast, trade secrets are, by definition, secret, and equally important, they don't always expire. So in a trade secrecy regime, it can be even harder for others to build on earlier work. Trade secrecy also reduces the government's ability to regulate, to regulate the use of secret chemicals that could pollute the environment or harm employees, to regulate who owns information and how it's used. So consider Facebook again and Google. Their businesses are largely based on monetizing user-generated content. But perhaps it's the users who should own control and earn a profit from their posts. 
And even if you're okay with Google and Facebook, consider the other firms monetizing the data that they collect. Hook up sites like Tinder and a company that makes a product called WeVibe, not an exercise machine. Um, so trade secrets have strong negative social implications. Yet recent international efforts to increase trade secrecy protection suggest that as the scope of patentable subject matter shrinks, trade secrecy is becoming a dominant strategy. So here's some of that research agenda. Can we identify where IP rights are needed? Can we safely liberate some forms of human creativity, such as scientific discoveries, into the public domain because rights aren't needed in that space, or because rights over downstream end products will be sufficient to spur upstream fundamental discoveries. What alternatives will innovators use if IP is not available? What's the social impact of those strategies? Would the public be better off if we relied on strategies other than exclusive IP rights, such as government subsidies, tax incentives, and prizes? Using public money or tax breaks means that the resulting products can be put in the public domain and accessed cheaply, but it also means that all taxpayers must pay, even for innovations some have no interest in supporting. So which system best enhances social welfare? Prizes are an interesting idea. Think of the longitude prize. But prizes require a central authority to anticipate social needs. And the authority must also know enough to determine when the need has in fact been met. So the longitude prize was not initially conferred because no one understood how a clock could be the solution to the longitude problem. Nonetheless, work is underway to perfect prize systems. Now, some suggest that we stick with exclusive rights, but tailor each regime to individual sectors as they emerge. Sui generis legislation. Someone told me an oration was supposed to be in Latin, so that's your Latin. Sui generis legislation. Uh, so Beth, whose team is creating many, many wonderful databases, uh, asked me to talk about how they should be protected. I'm happy to do that because it's one area where we already have some empirics to consider. In 1991, after the US Supreme Court decided that databases are not copyrightable, the EU saw an opportunity to cultivate its own database industry. In 1996, it enacted a, director require, a directive rather, requiring each member of state of the EU to protect databases that involve substantial investment from unauthorized extraction. Rights expire 15 years after the database is complete. The more IP the EU thought, the more investment. So how has that worked out for them? Surprisingly poorly. The EU Commission conducted a review in 2005, and it found, quote, no clear indication that the sui generis right helped businesses in the database sector to improve their competitiveness. And the database industry has certainly not shifted to Europe. Moreover, courts have had trouble deciding what constitutes a substantial investment. After all, businesses often compile databases for their own internal operations. Basically, they're user innovations that don't require IP incentives. Furthermore, unlike with copyrights and patents, it's turning out that database rights are perpetual. The drafters of the EU directive were clearly not thinking of modern dynamic databases, which continuously update and are thus never complete enough to trigger the 15-year term. The EU measure also includes a reciprocity provision. Databases of non-EU nationals are protected in the EU only when the other countries reciprocate with database rights of their own. Tellingly, other countries have not reciprocated. On the whole, the view elsewhere is that data, facts about the world, should be available to everyone, that rights over data create too much control over follow-on innovation that compilers should compete not on what facts they own, but rather on how well they update, configure, and annotate their databases to meet the needs of their customers. As important, there are other techniques to ensure a return on investment. Electronic compilations are protected technologically and by laws against computer hacking. Costs and profits are captured through contractual arrangements between the compiler and its customers. There's another assessment going on in the EU right now. But there's a cautionary tale here. Even if they decide that the database directive was a mistake, 
clawing back rights is close to impossible. So my view is that moves to sui generis systems must be regarded with caution. Tying the law to a particular technology means that when the technology moves on, the law is useless or has unintended consequences. The availability of special rules encourages rent seeking, and each new system requires new international negotiations. To a large extent, then, I'd retain the current system, but work on various elements in it. So is a full-scale IP right needed if the main cost is, say, in commercialization? Perhaps we should have weaker, shorter commercialization patents if that's all that requires encouragement. Where the costs lie not in discovering the product, but in obtaining regulatory approval for it, a scenario in the pharmaceutical sector, then we might recognize IP for only the discovery. The work to generate regulatory data could, for example, be compensated through a liability rule. It will let others use the data so long as they pay a fair share of the cost. If or when we revise IP law in light of the findings on where it's needed, we could also enhance measures that further the public interest. Defenses that permit experimentation, repair, compulsory licenses, government crown use. We'd worry less about awarding rights that inhibit follow-on innovation if we knew that tinkering around in research could occur despite IP rights. We also need to beef up rules regarding ownership, rules that clarify who owns data, that define the rights relinquished upon the sale of electronics and electronic files. Furthermore, we should revisit the relationship between IP and competition law. In particular, we need law that factors network effects into the question where the right holder has market power. We might consider fundamental discoveries to be the equivalent of essential facilities. A right holder could own it, but it would be obliged to license it out. Trade secrecy protection has only recently come to the fore, as I've said. While we now have internationally agreed rights, the development of public safeguards is in its infancy. So we need to ensure a right to regulate. In particular, algorithms, software, AI, now make decisions with significant personal impact including about jobs, credit, bail, sentencing, immigration. They also control voting machines, the ads Facebook displays, the news feed subscribers see. The public needs a right to study these algorithms to ensure they're accurate, unbiased, and not distorting commercial outcomes or exerting improper political influence. Today's New York Times has an article about algorithmic accountability. That's what I mean. We might also make the award of IP rights conditional on applicants using their technology or expertise to confer certain public benefits. So another problem with an IP system is that it induces creative production through the ability of consumers to pay. That leaves some societal needs unmet. Examples include research on neglected diseases, like dengue fever, that uniquely <coughs> afflict populations that can pay. Research on technologies that abate the sources of climate change, which everyone wants so long as somebody else is paying for it. Patent rights could be made contingent on right holders using their expertise and facilities to fulfill some of those needs while they're, while they're finding commercially new, new products, valuable products. Prizes might also work here. Indeed, there's a new longitude prize being awarded for work on antibiotics. Uh, which is another area where IP generates insufficient incentives. We might also want to consider applying human rights doctrines to IP practice. That might increase access to important innovations that help the poor, give data subjects more control over personal information, and the public the ability to study impactful algorithms. So that's the substantive side. As I said, I also want to mention institutions. Living in the U.S. under Donald Trump, I have to believe that the most important components of governance regimes are strong institutional arrangements. Courts that work despite claims of the bias of so-called judges, a legislature that operates even with tweets that belittle congressmen, congressmen that publish despite threats to journalists. So what's interesting here for researchers is that the proliferation of IP-related institutions creates many opportunities for comparative study. 
Some of the questions about our institutions are, we, are about institutions we already have. So two examples, specialized courts. So many countries have adopted patent or IP courts on the theory that technically complex cases require specially trained judges. But is it true that specialized judges do a better job on these kinds of cases? Immersion in narrow fields could produce bias and tunnel vision and lead to overprotection, which seems to be the US experience with the federal circuit, the court that hears patent appeals. Or it could make adjudicators really skeptical about claims of inventiveness, as seems to be true in Japan and in US trial courts, where Stanford's Mark Lumley found that familiarity breeds contempt. Comparative work on these courts could tell us a great deal. Universities are another institution with an important role in technological progress, particularly because they are the locus of so much government-supported research. In the early 2000s, the US decided that the best way to ensure the transfer, in the 1980s rather, the US decided the best way to ensure the transformation of upstream research, uh, at taxpayer-supported research, into downstream products would be to encourage universities to hold patent rights and faculty output. Universities have invested heavily in technology transfer offices, TTOs, but most TTOs turn out to lose money. As a result, it isn't clear that they are the best stewards of translational activities. There are now other models for commercialization of taxpayer-funded research. Australia and CSIRO are pioneers here. Uh, the US has just entered with the National Center for Advancing Translational Studies. Uh, it's following the example, but it's only a few years old. Uh, there are also some other models. The University of California's Alfred E. Mann Institute California Institute for Quantitative Biosciences, QB3, MIT's the Spande Center. Researchers such as uh, Beth Webster's group, Monash's uh, Ann Manati, UC's Brian Wright, are already looking at tech transfer, and there are many interesting issues to study. The role of patents, who should own them, the researcher, the institution, who should choose the TTO, how the TTO should operate, uh, is it the same for every technology, or, or should there be differences for different technologies? All of those questions could use answers. We also need to nurture emerging institutions. So I, may, I mentioned contracts in connection with databases. More generally, contractual agreements coupled with strong enforceable social norms can substitute private ordered governance regimes for public law. These private regimes tailored to specific problems and participants are potentially more effective than sui generis legislation, which is aimed at particular technology. So consider knowledge commons. They are often used to create advances or platforms for advances that various entities will share. Examples include the Linux Foundation, the GenBank Repository of Sequencing Data, and the World Data Center for Microorganisms. The Commons includes rules on access to the information produced and on the allocation of rights in and profits from the resulting projects. Some also establish boundary rules to ensure the integrity of each type of contributor, be it public, private, commercial, or nonprofit. Another example, standard setting organizations, SSOs. In some fields, technologies are developed privately, but each firm's products are more valuable if they can interoperate. SSOs agree on standard and then standards, and then participants promise to license standard essential IP, mainly patents, on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, brand terms. Well, if private ordering is a way forward, we must consider the subsidiary legal rules required to make these schemes operate effectively. Is the current contracts regime optimal from either a private or social perspective? Do we need special protection for the weakest members of these regimes? Do we need law on what constitutes FRAN terms? We certainly have a lot of cases. How about law to protect the public from overreaching by these private parties? Before I close, I should also mention international institutions. The World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, the World Trading Organization, the WTO, regional organizations like NAFTA, mega regionals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, mm -hmm. the TPP and RCEP, 
and bilaterals such as the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, OSPATA. Um, these have combined to reduce national authority to formulate IP laws and norms, to regulate in the ways I've suggested. The multiplicity of these arrangements allows right holders to acquire power through regime shifting, international forum shopping. That's led to increasingly close harmonization and a ratcheting up of legal protection. This phenomenon deserves more nuanced attention. Is harmonization at high levels increasing global welfare? <clears throat> With so much uncertainty about how, how IP rights should be structured for new technological environments, perhaps we are better off with heterogeneity. If each country can legislate for itself, they can, in Justice Brandeis's words, serve as laboratories, experimenting with various approaches. Successful experiments could then be uploaded to the international <laughs> arena, or as with the EU's database directive, bad approaches can be rejected. And what about the justification for harmonization? Are they tenable? One theory is that every country is better off with a strong IP regime to encourage local innovation. It would be good to know if that's true. It has been true for the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, but not so much for other countries. A second theory is that harmonization stems research arbitrage, the brain drain that is said to occur when scientists migrate to where the law offers the most protection. Yet everyone who lives in a WTO country benefits from the commitment to national treatment. That means that, at least in theory, all face the identical set of incentives. Further harmonization won't change that. Harmonization is also justified on the ground that in a global economy, it's crucial to lower the transaction costs involved in multinational exploitation and enforcement. But there are other ways to reduce transaction costs. The Hague Conference on Private International Law is working on rules that facilitate multinational litigation. The United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCTRAL, is contemplating rules on transnational IP licensing. In the EU, there are also private memoranda of understanding, MOUs, on secondary liability that spell out the steps that intermediaries must take to stop infringement. Importantly, MOUs also clarify the steps inter that intermediaries need not take so that avenues of distribution and communication are preserved and disincentives to invest in new sharing technologies aren't created. These arrangements are attractive because they involve all the stakeholders who together, combining all of their expertise, can reach better decisions than can courts. MOUs can also be made internationally applicable. Another approach, an international court system. One is possibly being established even as we speak. So just as the EU was about to create a new unified patent court to adjudicate EU patents and to establish a new unitary patent good throughout most of the EU, Brexit occurred. The UK's exit from the EU is a major threat to that initiative in that the unitary patent is valuable only if it includes the UK market and the court is viable only if it includes highly experienced UK judges. To you keep the UK in the deal, negotiators may turn the Unified Patent Court into an international rather than an EU court. Once that's created, other countries might be free to join. A centralized court system would avoid cases like Apple against Samsung, where the parties sued each other over pretty much the same IP rights in nine different countries, and that's led at astonishingly high cost to conflicting decisions and pricey outcomes. There's precedent for this approach. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, requires centralized arbitration. As Melbourne University's Andrew Christie has shown, that system efficiently resolves international disputes over domain names. There's another possibility here. Brexit may be a forerunner of other unravelings. <coughs> Donald Trump has already pulled the US out of the TPP and may also kill NAFTA. There's even talk of his leaving the WTO. But the IP system is likely to still need a degree of international coordination. For that, new institutions and private ordering are likely to become even more important. 
So we live in interesting times, in an information age when our economy turns on technological um, development, when, in te when technologies and technologies for creating technologies are changing rapidly, we find ourselves in a world where international cooperation may be growing, but it might be fading. In this new era, we face an acute need for research on how IP law should be structured to efficiently transform ideas into products and disseminate them effectively. That's the goal to which Tom Sperling has dedicated its career, and it's been a pleasure to get to know the people here at Swinburne on both the law and business faculties who are following his splendid lead. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, terrific um, oration. I would now like to invite um, Professor Terry Healy to come up and, and uh, make a few comments about uh, Rochelle's oration. Uh, professor Healy is an adjunct professor at Swinburne University where he's writing the history of CSIRO. Um, professor Healy was special counsel for CSIRO and was responsible for the formation and leadership of CSIRO's legal function. Um, he spent nearly 50 years there, initially as a patent attorney, but eventually as general counsel. Uh, most importantly, he led the legal team responsible for successfully asserting CSIRO's wireless local area Wi-Fi patents from 2005 to 2015. This litigation was held in both the US and the Europe. Uh, Professor Healy is now an honorary fellow at CSIRO and a member of the Swinburne External Law Advisory Committee. Can you please welcome Professor Healy? Thank you, Beth. Um, I had a little bit of an impression from Rochelle as to the breadth and scope of the address that she was going to be giving tonight and was very daunted, but here goes. Um, I'm very honoured to be uh, presenting this short commentary on the address that she's given. Um, but first, I would just quickly like to mention um, my own thoughts about Tom Sperling and add to the warm thoughts that have already been expressed. Um, we are here to recognise the lifelong contribution that Tom has made to science in Australia, and particularly to the application of forefront science to the opportunities and problems facing Australia. As many of you know, Tom is endlessly curious about all manners of developments in science and technology, and people, and politics, and football, <laughs> especially about the mighty Tigers. Tom is also endlessly active, his fingers in many pies. It's a wonder he doesn't mix them up to form some sort of giant melange, but he doesn't. He skips from one topic to another with the grace and poise of a ballet dancer. Or should I say, Dustin Martin. <laughs> Tom's also a personal friend and colleague. We worked together over many years at CSIRO, and now we work together on the CSIRO History Project, as Beth has mentioned, a long-term project to record the people and work of CSIRO over the period of 1949 to about 2010. It's always interesting to be with Tom, very entertaining, and he brings a youthful spirit of enthusiasm to everything he touches, so thank you, Tom. As you know now, uh, Rochelle is also a colleague here at um, Swinburne, and that's been extremely illuminating for all of us, and she's been terrific company, and we really will uh, have appreciated her being here, and we will miss her when she goes back to New York. Um, at the invitation of Beth Webster, um, the address that you've had from Rochelle was deliberately very broad and very general. She talked about the elephant in the room at one point. Do we actually need intellectual property in future? From there, Rochelle examined areas where more research is needed <clears throat> to answer some pretty fundamental questions about the way that intellectual property works in our world. My own experience, mostly as a litigator in this space, has forced me to think about some of these issues, uh, particularly in the patent space. 
and I mention here that um, I'm putting aside tonight what I call the wombat in the room, namely copyright. It's an appallingly inefficient system, but beyond scope for these brief comments. Rochelle asked quite correctly whether the world still needs IP systems in order to provide the incentives necessary to maintain the pace of invention and technological change. I'm sure that this is a very important question that will continue to be debate, debated and worked upon for many years. And it's especially important for the world leaders in this space, and I'm thinking here of the US in particular, um, because they're in the vanguard of IP law and practice and call the shots, basically. So I thought it might be useful just to look at some of these questions from the point of view of Australia, um, not just to make my task easier, but also to sort of bring a, a domestic focus to some of these issues. So mostly at the insistence of the United States, the world already has a remarkably strong and uniform set of IP systems. These systems are enforced at the national level in other words, you need an IP system at every country because that's where it works. You can have international agreements in, a, in an environment like the, the European Union, which Rochelle has mentioned, but in the main they are national systems. But they are strongly reinforced through international conventions and agreements, chiefly the World Trade Organization and TRIPS. So, woe betide any nation, especially a smallish one like Australia, which tries to buck that system. The best that Australia can do, in my view, is to figure out where its best interests lie and then optimise its position within the degrees of freedom open to it without, hopefully, incurring the wrath of the almighty Office of the Trade Representative um, in the US. The Australian Productivity Commission last year provided a thoughtful contribution on the question and concluded that in the case of Australia, it should stiffen its tests for inventive step in the patent space and raise patent renewal and claim fees. I think both of these are very sensible recommendations. Raising fees in particular, I think, is fairly safe. Other nations already have much higher fees without attracting adverse attention from the US or the WTO. These include Sweden, which charges around about, in Australian dollar terms, $10,000 per annum to renew a patent in the later stages of its life. Given that more than 50% of Australian patents are abandoned within 10 years, and that escalating renewal fees are standard practice, raising these fees provides an easy avenue to reduce the problem of nuisance patents. Those that occupy space in the IP ether in any particular country without corresponding value to anyone. And that's either to the public or to the patentee. But if they're cheap, many of the patentees will just let them sit there. Indeed, in my personal view, we should think about even higher fees for patent renewals after 10 years. Rose <coughs> renewal fees would be a partial solution to present problems as outlined by Rochelle. But they could also help with what I see as a gathering problem a likely tsunami of patent applications coming our way from China. In saying this, I accept that I'm drawing a long bow named into a very uncertain future. However, every year China now trains more than twice as many engineers and scientists as does the US, and this ratio is rising rapidly. The Chinese Patent Office now receives almost twice as many applications as the US Patent and Trademark Office that ratio is growing also. There is evidence that the quality of Chinese patent applications from Chinese applicants is still comparatively low. However, in my view, that is likely to be only temporary. I think the sheer volume of technical graduates in China will gradually, rapidly improve many things in China, including patent quality. So why do I mention this is a challenge to the IP system? In my view, our current strong world IP system is very much a creation of the US. For decades, the US has been the prime originator of top value IP. To 
protect that IP around the world, the US has pushed nations into ever stronger levels of IP protection. But what happens when the balance shifts? It's easy to foresee that China, with its legions of highly educated scientists and engineers, will overtake the US in creativity. The US could even become a net importer of IP value. Will we then see a duopoly, with the US and China competing furiously against each other, but agreeing to limit competition from upstart nations by maintaining strong intellectual property internationally? That is, keep the upstarts in their place by filling the IP spaces in their nations with patents and other IP rights owned primarily by the US and China. Or will that agreement break down, leaving universal world trade agreements to be gradually replaced by a plethora of tailored bilateral and multilateral agreements, each of which will include IP provisions which advance the interests of its dominant members? Remember, an IP system can be a source of great good, promoting free trade and globalisation of supply chains for the advantage of everyone. But the system could also be exploited by a nation intent on economic dominance. China already subsidises foreign patent applications by its citizens. It has recently pulled back on these subsidies, and Chinese origin patent applications in other countries are still low, only about 40,000 per annum. But this will surely change. In saying this, I don't at all mean to be alarmist. Australia is a niche player will have a happy and prosperous future, but only if it's smart. And one example of a space where Australia can prosper is through education and scientific research. And here we come back again to IP. In my view, Australia is ideally placed to become a world leading player in the conduct of very high quality research. We have excellent uni universities. <clears throat> we also have CSIRO. We have a patent attorney profession that is capable, excuse me, We have a patent attorney profession that's capable of capturing and securing IP rights around the world. We have a capacity to conduct scientific research largely free of constraints from third party IP. And scientists in Australia are much more free from this point of view than scientists in the United States even. Together these factors provide the basis for a real opportunity for Australia to find valuable interstices between the mighty pillars of IP that will doubtless keep being built by China the US and to a lesser extent by Europe and India, if they can get their act together. Of course, I would like to see a more solid basis for research freedom than Australia has at present. Japan has done it, why shouldn't we? Turning now to some of other specifics raised by Rochelle, I will mention first her comments about institutions. Enforcement of IP rights is notoriously expensive, hyper expensive. Post-grant review of patents seems to me to offer the best solution. It can be faster and more expert than court-based systems. We may lose some good patents, but that's the price you pay. We, it will weed out a lot of bad patents and do it more cheaply than going to court. Rochelle also mentioned standard-setting organisations or SSOs. As the world moves further towards distributed global manufacturing, Standardisation may become more important, particularly as was mentioned for interoperability. We need to get a balance between adopting best practice technologies and standards on the one hand, and on the other hand, ensuring that reasonable returns are available, but not excessive returns. Just incidentally, you might have seen in recent days that Qualcomm a very important innovator in communication technology in the United States is currently the target of a takeover offer by Broadcom, a major chip maker. This offers for more than $100 billion. Qualcomm has been an outstanding performer as a licensor of IP. If the takeover succeeds, this may see a fall in the use of standards and a rise in the use of proprietary systems by a handful of key players namely Intel, Intel, Samsung and Broadcom. A growth in world scale proprietary systems would raise another issue mentioned by Rochelle, trade secrets. 
For all its faults, the patent system has the virtue of promoting early public disclosure of ideas. Trade secret protection, by its very nature, tries to hide these ideas for as long as possible. Hiding is much more practical in a single corporation, hence my mention of Qualcomm, than where licensing between parties is involved through standard setting organisations. Rochelle discussed the myriad cases and related efforts to control the scope of patent protection by reference to ideas about patentable subject matter. I think and agree with Rochelle that's a very fertile area for debate. Beth Webster raised the question, where is science and technology heading and what regulatory environment would best bring their promise to the marketplace? It would be wonderful, as Rochelle mentioned, to have a crystal ball that would tell us where science and technology are headed over the next century. Absent that, we need to make sure that we, we and I'm talking about Australia here, position ourselves for a wide range of possibilities. And the best way to do that is to make sure that we're smart and flexible. And as far as possible, keep the IP system as the servant and not the master. Thank you. So we now have um, 10 minutes for questions. Rochelle and Terry, do you want to stay up here? Um, if people can, is there a microphone? Yeah, uh, over here, people want to put up their hand, um, maybe say who they are and um, who, which, who they want to ask. That's the question to. Okay, good evening. Uh, that was a very good oration, by the way. I went to a Nobel Laureate one and that was just as good. <laughs> uh, that was, this was a Graham Clark, uh, Graham Clark one. Else. Anyway, uh, my name is Reza. I recently migrated down here to Australia from Malaysia. And uh, I was a technology project manager for an oil and gas corporation. So it was my job to negotiate for, with companies who hold IP over certain technologies to license them to us. So the question I have is related to product stewardship. So. Uh, with the continued debate over climate change and its impact to health, uh, especially, I was just wondering whether the current intellectual property landscape is prepared to support uh, patents that uh, protect uh, the development of new technologies in the reuse, recovery, or recycling of uh, not the creation of products, but the recovery or the recycling of products that are already under very, very strong intellectual property protection. Thank you. You want to know whether there are patents on the processes of recycling? Is that the question? Yeah. So I'm talking about proprietary materials. Yeah. We have a lot of nanotechnology-based materials, a yeah. lot of uh, new alloys being created, new polymers. And uh, because, uh, so based on my experience, when somebody licensed to make the product and sell them, they gain rights and certain immunities to market it to specific end users, but not necessarily for other purposes. So if somebody were to come up with a new technology, which is to file a new patent that discusses the reuse or recycling or conversion of that uh, currently protected uh, product into something else. Well, sometimes you can get process patents and sometimes you can't. It depends on whether it's a new and inventive process. But I think what you're describing is that the complexity of the world that we now live in, in which people have patents on whole different parts of an entire process. And then the question is not just whether you can get the patents in the first place, but how do you actually exploit those patents when you need all the other people's permission? So questions about how you deal with blocking patents, how do you deal with um, a product or a process that is could come to market, people would like it, it would be a great product, but there are so many different patents in it, you need everybody to agree. And that's, that's been a really hard question. Uh, one of the places that maybe competition law could play a role is in dealing with the holdouts, the people who say, I've got a good process for you, you've got to pay me all the value and not pay to anybody else. So I think you're pointing to a 
complex problem and complex technologies. Marcus Wigan, Professor of Fellow at Wollongong University in IT and Society. One of the things that you highlighted, but didn't follow up very much, is the rapid convergence between governance of states and intellectual property. It's IT, between governance uh -huh. of states and organizations and the ethics of people involved. In each of them you touched on it and moved away. These issues can no longer be avoided. And as it becomes a dominant issue, and becomes more and more public and public outside the technical frame. I'm sure that you have views on this that would be useful to hear. Ethics starting to matter, governance is mattering more and more. Transparency is a central feature, as you raised. Well, there, transparency is a major issue, both in terms of domestic lawmaking and also international lawmaking. So we're seeing, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiated entirely in secret, then the United States leaves, so now we have TPP-11 being negotiated entirely in secret. So we can, Australia is actually very nice, it's actually provided some indication of what its approach is going to be. Not every country does that, so everybody looks at Australia. Um, New Zealand sometimes leaks these documents, so yay for New Zealand too. Um, but uh, you know, USTR certainly keeps them very, very, very close to the chest. And I, I think that's a, that's a real problem. I think it's a problem because all you get are the people who have the ear of the trade representative talking about what the law should be, and you don't get the ear, you don't get other people talking about it. So a lot of users of intellectual property, I mean, I think the problem that Terry pointed out about we're going to create all this law, and then China's going to be the one that uses it, and it's going to be the detriment of everybody else. That's a real problem, and it's not what I think the trade representatives who are negotiating these treaties are thinking about. Uh, thanks. Very nice lecture. Um, I'm uh, Dave Winkler. I work at Monash and La Trobe Universities, and I was working at uh, CSRO for quite a few years. In fact, Tom gave him a job, and uh, Dave Solomon as well. Um, I work in sort of interface between chemistry and AI, and I think the growth of AI in the, in the future is going to be massive. So my question really is, what happens to, to uh, IP when the inventor is no longer human or perhaps even alive, so an AI system? Uh, Sam Rickardson is sitting there. He's been thinking about this for much longer than I have. Um, but uh, Sam teaches at, uh, at Melbourne, and there's... They're doing a festriff for him, and the first thing in the festriff is about who owns uh, these products that are produced by AI, not by produced by humans. And we really don't have any law on that. So it's an interesting question. Is it the producer of the AI that then gets a reach through to every single thing that's produced? Somehow that doesn't seem right. Um, on the other hand, somebody produced it. Do you have yeah. thoughts on AI? Uh, I defer to Sam, of course, but um, it, it's a little bit analogous to cameras. So there is established law that um, the person that takes the picture, who actually pushes the button and sets it up, is the one who owns the copyright in the picture, even though there's an enormous amount of technology in modern cameras. Um, and I think probably AI is a bit like that, so that if if there's a human being who's doing the controlling about whatever it is that the AI system produces, then that pro that person probably can be the author or the inventor. Um, but if if it's some sort of you know just automatic thing like a, a camera snapping away in the dark um, without ever, anyone having set it up, then maybe there's no owner. The problem with AI is it's not so direct the way a picture is, right? These these systems wind up doing surprising things, things that the original... Looking like person, intelligence. Yeah, or like a Nazi sometimes, but... Uh, is the problem if you don't have IP, all of a sudden the ownership of everything is the profiteer in the money? And uh, as we've seen in the banking industry and finance, the thing about intellectual property is that it's protecting intangibles. These are things that 
there's no scarcity, right? They're non-rivalrous goods. Uh, I have a fabulous way of making coffee. I can give it to Terry, and then we both have a fabulous way of making coffee. So it's not like some one person owns it. Once the idea is out there, if it's out there and not protected by IP, then everybody can use it. That's the that's the sad thing about IP. It, it creates scarcity, even though there doesn't need to be any scarcity. Uh, it's like a candle. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. You can you have a taper, and you can light many other tapers, and then everybody has light, and you still have to light yourself. I'd just like to add a couple of thoughts to that. We talk, both of us, about trade secrets. And to me, um, there is a, a movement happening in the world towards bigger and bigger corporations acquiring other smaller inventive corporations and turning into vast conglomerates with enormous power. Um, and when I was litigating in the United States, I'm sure that I saw signs of that, that you had a, a small number of very big, powerful firms that were behaving in competition law terms like incumbents. And it was their aim, um, it seemed to me, uh, through a, a bunch of actions that I can mention in a moment, to weaken the IP system because as incumbents, they had a sufficient market power to be able to get pretty much what they wanted. And IP in the hands of an upstart company was actually a problem. And so they actually tried to weaken IP. So. If, in answer to your question, IP can be a force for good because it can actually open up competition from new players and it can also facilitate sharing through the processes of licensing. Um, if you're relying on trade secrets as your way of protecting your IP, licensing's hard because you have to disclose it to third parties and rely on the laws of confidentiality and so forth, which are pretty shaky in my view. <laughs> Hello, um, Angeline Bartholomew is from Monash. Um, the cost of research and development is really quite small in terms of getting a product onto market. And in the pharmaceutical industry, phase one, two, three clinical trials are incredibly expensive. And they're not, uh, most pharmaceutical companies won't invest or even look at a new concept or idea if they don't have rights because they know the pathway to get that to market is so expensive. Um, how, without IP, that's not gonna happen. So how do you think it should change in industries like that? Um, uh, and it's not just the pharmaceutical industries, it's industries which require a, you know, a large investment to translate that idea or concept into a product. For right now, the IP system is a big part of that, and I think that's right. Um, but it doesn't have to be. So, for example, there's a lot of um, medical research that's now being done by public-private partnerships, um, and part of the reason that they do that is because there's an awful lot of diseases where the people aren't going to be able to pay. If the people can't pay, IP is useless, right? IP is a promise that somebody will pay you. And if the people who are the sick people can't pay, the IP doesn't work. So we already need to find new systems and new ways to try to promote the creation of, uh, of, of products for neglected diseases, for communities, non-market economies. Uh, and there is some work to, on that. So people are, have equipment that they use for one purpose, uh, they allow it to be used for another purpose when they're not using it, or they uh, get the IP rights in some technologies, but they don't get the IP rights for all applications. Uh, or they license the IP rights out for free for certain applications. Uh, prizes are being used for that purposes as well. So um, Bill Gates Foundation has created several different ways of supporting research for malaria. Um, there's a guy named Thomas Pogge who is starting this, uh, prize, this, this fund in which um, uh, big donors, countries, all pay money into a system to create pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceutical company that creates the pharmaceutical gets paid based on how many people have been cured, the increase in quality of life years. Uh, so qualities are me measured for the reasons, we, know, we understand how they work um, and this is a way to 
um, not only encourage people to develop medicines for dengue fever and you know, these things where people can't pay, but also to get the drugs actually to the people and make sure that they're in a form where the people will actually take them because you're only going to get paid if people get healthier, not simply inventing the drug. Um, so there are other ways that people have been exploring, and I think we probably need to do a lot more of that exploration. Brian, Brian Wright uh, from UC Berkeley. I'm visiting Beth's group here for a month or so. Uh, I think uh, the case of vaccines is a very interesting case because um, prizes and government provision can be very good when it's very clear what the government needs. And in the case of vaccines, the US government's known for many years that they need vaccines to, so that they can send soldiers to other countries and not die of disease before they kill whoever they're supposed to kill. Um, oh, good. And, and, and that's worked pretty well uh, because it's very clear <laughs> what the government needs. The government can run uh, trials just as well as a, a pharmaceutical <laughs> conglomerate can. Um, and I think we, for those kind of issues, I think we shouldn't be using IP. We should. It, it's a ridiculous thing to have uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, run trials, and you ask, and, and you find out that their expenditure on IP is less than their expenditure on advertising. They tell you they need to do the advertising so that they can get the IP funded. So this is a deadweight loss on top of a deadweight loss. It's a, it's a very expensive system. It's necessary in some areas, but not in all. Uh, I, I was interested in Terry's uh, comment on the interest of large um, duopolies or oligopolies in maybe weakening IP. And I think in some ways the campaign against patent trolls is partly about that, that large conglomerates are threatened when somebody has an essential patent that's not a member of the club. And so they don't want that, that non-member to disrupt the club. Uh, when I was at the company that's now Novartis, we do all this research, we'd have to submit it to the Food and Drug Administration. And we were always thinking, why, why us? Why are we doing this safety and efficacy stuff? It's against our interest to find out that something isn't safe and effective. And the FDA <laughs> does a huge amount of work checking the research that the scientists are doing. So every mouse that we used in a mouse study, every rat we used in a rat, had to be accounted for because they were afraid a bunch of them were being killed off and we weren't telling. So it, the current system is crazy, I agree with you. And if you actually look at history, of course there are an awful lot of important medicines that were invented during wartime uh, by the DA, by the Departments of Defense. Penicillin. I'd now like to invite um, Mr. Graham Goldsmith up to give a vote of thanks. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Beth. And I'd like to sincerely thank Professor, Professor Dreyfus for your excellent address and responses to questions. To have such a distinguished researcher and educator clearly a global expert in this field with us has been a real honour. You've given us all insights and for those of us that are not practitioners in IP, new insights into the IP environment for science, technology and innovation and your ideas have resonated. Certainly there is plenty of food for thought as we move through the information age. I think your view of the post-scarcity society concept and the implications for IP was of interest to, as I've listened. And your comments about the impact of network effects on the ability of new competitive products to compete with some of the well-known technology products and services that we have today made a lot of sense. And your views of the different implications for protection of IP rights across a broad range of what are already everyday products and brands was enlightening. Your subsequent research agenda and fundamental questions left us all with plenty to think about as citizens of such a fast changing and connected world. Professor Dravis, can I ask you to come forward and please accept this small gift as a memento of your address tonight and can I please ask the audience to join me in thanking you. I'd also like to thank uh, adjunct professor Terry Healy for your delightful comments about Tom 
and for your thoughtful and thought-provoking response to Professor Dravis's address, especially putting some of the issues identified into an Australian and regional context. Terry, could I also ask you to come forward and please accept this gift on our behalf? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal part of proceedings. But uh, on behalf of the University and the Centre for Transformative Innovation, I'd like to invite everyone to join us for supper in the area just outside the lecture theatre. Thank you again to everyone for joining us. Thanks. Thanks.